It is morning of November 4th of the year 1791, and a ragtag group of American soldiers hastily make a formation as a large line of Miami, Shawnee, and Lenape they fire from the trees. The American lines immediately break, and as men begin to turn and run away, the fire begins to come from the other side of the tree line. One of the lines that broke is able to turn and fire a volley back at the other native line, but the trees are deflecting their shots. As this was happening, the Native Americans flanked the American line on both sides, and within 30 minutes, the Americans were completely surrounded. After three hours of bloody combat, the leader of the American line, Arthur St. Clair, sounds the retreat. What just occurred has been called one of the most decisive defeats in U.S. history. However, the leaders of this new alliance of Native American nations, Blue Jacket of the Shawnee and Little Turtle of the Miami, were just getting started with their war. There are no written records of Blue Jacket before 1773, when he was already a grown man and a leader among the Shawnee. When a British missionary recorded Blue Jacket residing in a town on Deer Creek in modern Ross County, Ohio. Meanwhile, Little Turtle was born sometime between 1747 and 52 in modern Whitley County, Indiana. Little Turtle lived in a town along the Eel River called Turtle Town until 1780. Both Blue Jacket and Little Turtle were allied with the British during the American Revolution, understanding that if the U.S. were able to attain independence, they would immediately start settling west of the Proclamation Line of 1763, which would be an existential threat to them. Upon the independence of the United States, delegates from 35 nations met on the Sandusky River in Ohio. The council agreed that no treaties will be made with the United States without the consent of all involved. While the U.S. Congress recognized native rights to land on paper, the Indian Affairs Committee of Congress was already drafting plans to drive the Native Americans west of the Miami River. The Great Lakes Council reconvened in August of 1784 at the town of Niagara on the Lake in modern Ontario, Canada to meet with representatives of the United States. But the U.S. representatives were late and many of the nations had left by the time they arrived. The remaining representatives of the Great Lakes Council, several Iroquois representatives, and some from modern Ohio were called to Fort Stanwix. The Iroquois representatives agreed to relinquish their claims on Ohio, but the Iroquois government refused to ratify the treaty, saying it had no right to give the United States the land, while the Ohioan natives rejected the treaty under the same pretense. However, the U.S. then signed the Treaty of Fort McIntosh in January of 1785, where only a few nations' representatives signed over most of Ohio. That same year, U.S. soldiers began occupying Ohio. Another treaty in January of 1786 supposedly allowed American settlement of a tract of land north of the Ohio River, but was rejected by a council of 35 nations in September of the same year. Then Logan's Raid occurred, where 13 Shawnee villages were burned despite the man the Americans were after, Melintha, handing himself over peacefully. Meanwhile, another expedition up the Wabash River turned back with nothing accomplished. War has returned to the Midwest. The Shawnee refugees were welcomed by the Miami to resettle along the Wabash River. The next meeting of the Northwest Confederacy was supposed to be in the Shawnee villages burned by Logan, but was moved to the Wyandotte village of Brownstown on the Detroit River. Mohawk leader Joseph Brandt spoke before the council, and on December 18th, 
the Confederacy, under the new name of United Indian Nations, sent a letter to the Congress of the United States declaring all recent treaties invalid because the entirety of the Confederacy was not involved. They also called for a new treaty to be made in spring of 1787. Until then, the Confederacy suggested the Americans stay on their side of the Ohio River. In response, the U.S. Congress created the Northwest Territory in July of 1787. Arthur St. Clair, newly appointed territorial governor, moved to Marietta in modern Ohio, the new territorial capital. He was ordered to negotiate with the natives and not cede any lands relinquished by older treaties. In 1788, St. Clair invited the nations of the Confederacy to meet with him at Fort Harmer near Marietta. However, when Joseph Brandt attempted to renegotiate the border to the Muskingum River, St. Clair refused the idea. Brandt decided to boycott the meeting and declared others should do the same. St. Clair was convinced he had divided the Northwest Confederacy, with those living closest to the Americans wanting compromise, and those living further away sticking to the old boundary. However, St. Clair's new treaty of Fort Harmer only proved to discredit those willing to compromise. Violence between Native Americans and the American settlers continued to escalate. When George Washington was inaugurated as America's first president in 1790, he decided the Northwest Confederacy had to be defeated to ensure American expansion. In April of 1790, General Josiah Harmer marched into Ohio Territory and attacked the Shawnee village of Chalagatha. In response, the natives attacked a town called Limestone, modern Maysville, Kentucky. In October, Harmer marched northwest yet again toward the Miami capital of Kikianga. Blue Jacket, leader among the Shawnee and Little Turtle of the Miami, decided to act to end this transgression. They gathered 600 to oppose Harmer's 1,400 soldiers and watched Harmer's men march. Harmer reached Kikianga on October 15th to find all civilians evacuated and the town heavily fortified. The Americans spent the next few days sacking the surrounding towns, facing occasional raids by the natives, where Harmer's men fought in a disorganized fashion and were often defeated. Harmer left Kikianga on October 21st, declaring his objective complete, having destroyed five Miami towns. He later allowed 400 men to go back to ensure Kikianga is not reoccupied, but these men were ambushed and soundly defeated. Harmer's men retreated following this, with 183 killed or captured. Blue Jacket went to Fort Detroit, knowing the Americans would return, and attempted to get the help of the British. However, he was refused aid. The villages around Kikianga were rebuilt, and the victory over Harmer was followed by raids into Ohio. In March of 1791, Arthur St. Clair was placed in charge of the Army regiments in the Northwest and was ordered to launch another expedition to the Northwest. St. Clair launched raids in May and August, destroying several towns. In September, St. Clair marched Northwest, building Fort Hamilton in modern Hamilton, Ohio, and Fort Jefferson to the north in mid-October. The expedition faced food shortage, low morale, and desertion. On October 31st, St. Clair ordered one of his regiments south, losing many soldiers. On November 3rd, his army camped on the shore of the Wabash River, near modern Fort Recovery, Ohio. The next morning before dawn, a force of 1,000 Native Americans, led by Blue Jacket and Little Turtle, attacked the camp, firing from the cover of the trees. The Americans were startled awake by this and hastily got their weapons to fire back, but many broke and ran. Within 30 minutes, the Americans were surrounded. After three hours of bloody combat, a bayonet charge ordered by Lieutenant Colonel William Drake created a temporary gap in the native line, allowing St. Clair to sound a retreat. 
630 Americans were killed with 250 wounded, while the Native Americans lost over 21 with 40 wounded, making St. Clair's defeat one of, if not the most, decisive military defeat the United States ever faced. Following the battle, Blue Jacket and Little Turtle decided to abandon Kikianga and relocate their political center to the confluence of the Maumee and Auglaize rivers, a cluster of towns known as the Glaze. The reason for this was that Kikianga was hard to defend and was a target of American campaigns. The Glaze became the political center for the Great Lakes Confederacy for the duration of the war. After St. Clair's defeat, Congress passed a bill raising the army size to 5,000 men with Major General Anthony Wayne as the new commander. While readying his new army, Washington attempted diplomacy, having officials meet with 50 Iroquois leaders in March of 1792, where they were invited to the next meeting of the Northwest Confederacy to present their peace terms. The U.S. also attempted diplomacy with the Confederacy, but all ambassadors sent were killed. In June, Fort Jefferson was attacked. In late September, a large council was held at the Glaze, where Red Jacket of the Iroquois came to present the American peace offer. Red Jacket suggested that the Confederacy accept the Muskingum River as a new border, but the Shawnee orator, Red Pole, representing the Northwest Confederacy, stated they did not come to discuss further land sessions to the Americans. And he said, we do not want compensation. We want restitution of our country. Red Pole went on to say the only acceptable border was the Ohio River and all American forts north of it must be destroyed. Red Jacket admitted this demand in his report to American officials. U.S. Secretary of War Henry Knox suspended all military action to await the peace negotiations. At the Peace Council, in spring of 1793, the Northwest Confederacy presented its ultimatum. The Ohio River was the only acceptable boundary, and all American forts and settlers had to be removed. However, the Iroquois, represented by Joseph Brandt, refused to concede and the U.S. commissioners argued it was too expensive to move the American settlers. The Confederacy suggested the U.S. use the money they intended to buy native land with, and that had been used to raise more soldiers. During the negotiations, U.S. General Anthony Wayne gathered a new American force known as the Legion of the United States. Following the failed negotiations, Wayne prepared his men to march northwest, reaching Fort Jefferson on October 17th. North of Fort Jefferson, Wayne ordered Fort Greenville to be built, and on December 23rd, Wayne led a force of 300 men to the site of St. Clair's defeat, building Fort Recovery while dead were still laying where they died. In late June of 1794, a force of Chickasaw and Choctaw joined Wayne at Fort Recovery to fight their traditional enemies in the Northwest Confederacy. On June 27th, a large skirmish broke out between the Choctaw and a large force advancing from the Glades. The native army marching toward Fort Recovery numbered 1,200 warriors. While Blue Jacket suggested going around Fort Recovery to attack supply lines, he was overruled by those who wished to attack closer to the fort. The force attacked the supply convoy, then rushed to the fort's gate, but were driven back by gun and cannon fire. On August 20th, the Legion marched toward the Maumee River near modern Toledo, Ohio. Blue Jacket prepared an ambush at a site where a tornado had just destroyed hundreds of trees, creating natural barriers. The attack began on center of the American line, 
prompting Wayne to send his reserves there. Then he divided his force into two flanks. The left flank formed into two lines to stop the charging natives, while the right flank extended into one 800-yard long line. Artillery was brought to the line, blasting the natives with grape shot. Blue Jacket's force was in disarray. Then Wayne shouted for his men to stage a bayonet charge. The Dragoons charged first, with around 12 dying. Blue Jacket's forces fled the battlefield. The battle became known as the Fallen Timbers, and it was the last time the Northwest Confederacy staged a large force against the United States. In 1795, the Confederacy negotiated the Treaty of Greenville with the U.S. The treaty forced the Native Americans to cede southeastern Ohio and tracts of land around American settlements in Illinois country to recognize the U.S. as the principal power in the region and to surrender 10 leaders as hostages until all American prisoners are returned. The Northwest Confederacy broke apart following the war, with many swearing to peace. The Northwest, or Great Lakes Confederacy, was the high point of Native American resistance in the Midwest. While the Confederacy's attempts at unifying the Native nations of the Midwest failed, however largely due to the intolerance of the United States, a new Pan-Indian movement would form in the early 1800s under the leadership of Shawnee leader Tecumseh and his brother Tenskatawa. Blue Jacket died in 1810, and Little Turtle died two years later in the Miami capital of Kikianga, modern Fort Wayne, Indiana. The Northwest Confederacy defined the history of the early Midwest, and even today, its traces can be found, as the state of Indiana literally means land of the Indians, and with good reason, too. Thanks for